Good to see everybody out this morning, especially those who are visiting with us. We're glad that you're here and encourage you to be pick up your Bibles and study with us this morning. We're continuing in chapter 18 in the book of Acts, Paul's second journey. And before we get into that, let's take a look at the chapter titles this morning. Church is established. Watch out. Good. Stephen's arrest and death. Six and seven. Six and seven. See, when I scramble them up, you have a hard time with your cheat sheets. <laughs> Jesus' ascension. Okay. First persecutions. All right. Saul's uh, conversion of Saul. Nine. Eunuch. All right. Cornelius. All right. Christians first in Antioch. Eleven. All right. Jerusalem Conference. Fifteen. There you go. Paul's first journeys. Sixteen. Hmm? Thirteen and fourteen. All right. Death of Ananias and Sapphira. Five. All right. Five. All right. Persecutions of Judea. Twelve. Twelve. There you go. Con uh, conversion of Philippian jailer. 16, all right. Paul's second journey. 17. 17 and 18. There they all are. All right. Good. It's getting there. We're working on it. This is a good thing. What we want to pick up with this morning is Paul being in Corinth at this time. If you remember Wednesday night when we finished up, he had he had made his presentation in Athens. Little to, to no success. You know, Luke doesn't really give us a lot of information about it. And he makes the move. And then and, and me moves from Athens on over to Corinth, both still in the in the province of Achaia, and he's there. Now now this is forty five miles to the west of Athens, and Paul is still waiting, if you recall, Paul is still waiting for Timothy and Silas to show up. You know, after he came down from Macedonia and got to Athens, he turned the escort around and said, You get right on back up there and tell those two guys to get back here. And come on down. So they did. And, then, and he's still waiting for them to show up while he's still here in Corinth. So as he's uh, looking at this city, seeing what's going on, Corinth is known for a lot of things, and most of them aren't good. Okay, Corinth is not a good city at all. It's got a lot of immorality, uh, a lot of problems with that way. In fact, if, you, if, if it was known or your people knew you as, as being from Corinth, it wasn't a good thing you wanted to have people know. And so that was part of the part of the issues, part of the things going on, and part of the understanding that we can get. I mean, if you recall, one of the first things in the book of First Corinthians is the issue that he had with the with the, the immorality going on even inside the church. And he writes to that effect. Here's the background for it. Here's why. Okay? And we'll talk more about that and see some things as, as that develops, particularly on the third journey, as he as he as he writes that. So he um, is at Corinth. Corinth is the city laid out similar to this. And what I want you to see with this is Corinth is listed is is shown here on an isthmus, uh, which which is simply said it's it's a piece of uh, a skinny piece of property, you know, land. But it's bordered on both sides by water, by two key, key bodies of water. And Corinth is, in fact, serviced by two particular harbors. Uh, the harbor on the east side of that is Chincheria, and the harbor on the west side is uh, Lachium. And both these connect together in that, tra in the, in the commerce is incredibly important in that part of the world. In fact, one of the sought-after items from, from Corinth is the brass. Corinthian brass, as it's as it's was pub, uh, uh, produced in that part of the country. So it's it's a big it's an important city as far as Rome is concerned. A lot of transportation, a lot of commerce coming in and out of there. It's a wealthy city, and it, and there's a lot of a lot of things going on there. Of course, like I said, the reputation of the city is not good, and so Paul Paul speaks to that. But as Paul gets there, and as he's there. He meets, he meets some, people, some people, and we talked about this briefly Wednesday night because as he gets there, he meets Aquila and Priscilla. An interesting point I want to share with you here because it talks about he found a certain Jew by the name of Aquila, a native of Pontus. What's that mean? Okay, take a look. Pontus is here. There's Rome. 
That's where they had to leave from. They're down at they're down at uh, at uh, Corinth now, but Pontus is over here, 1,200 plus miles away. That's where he's from. Okay, he happens to be in Rome at the time. We don't know why, but the verse talks about they are told to leave. Let's talk about that in a moment. Having recently come from Italy, verse two, with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, he came to them. Claudius was a ruler, Roman ruler at this time. Typically speaking, and as far as Claudius was concerned, he was pretty tolerant of the Jewish nation. In other words, he, he understood them. Uh, he understood what they, were, what they were doing and so forth. But you think about the situations. Let's go back to Thessalonica. Let's go back to the cities with the uproar. Let's go back where all these issues had been created and Claudius just finally got fed up he said I'm done with you I'm going to show you what Rome can do get out of here and that's exactly what had happened and all this that you see colored on this map is the Roman Empire at this time all of this in the greens and the light tans this this but this is huge the Roman Empire at this time stretches out in fact, it gets clear up into to England, current England now. Okay, so it's 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 a big piece piece of property, and so at this point, with it being headquartered in Rome, Claudius says, "Out of here," and so they have to leave, and that's what brings them to Corinth at this time, and that's what brings them together then with Paul. Um, they came and he, and he came to them, verse two, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them. And they were working because their trade was tent makers. Understand that Silas and Timothy haven't showed up yet. All right? And it talks about here that he was in verse 4 that he was reasoning in the synagogues every Sabbath day and trying to persuade the Jews and Greeks. So he's got two things going on. He's, he's a tent maker, he's working to, to, to make a living at this point, keep, keep himself going, waiting for Tim, Timothy and Silas to show up to help. In the meantime, he hooks up with, with uh, um, Aquila and Priscilla, and they're working there together in, in, that, in that arrangement at this point. So, as he meets these folks, why, and we've talked about why Priscilla and Aquila were in there because of, of the decree of Claudius. What was the benefit of all of this for Paul at this point? What do you think? He's scratching out a living, got that, but incidentally, you know, being a tent maker at this point in time was, was not a bad deal. Okay? Generally, it was a pretty lucrative business to be into because of the nature of the, of the tents and so forth that had to be produced. So it wasn't all that bad of a, it was a good trade to be in at this point. But the benefits of this, at this time, when you think about it, Paul gets a bit of a break. Understand the, tr the route that he's been coming down through. All the issues have, you know, most of them have not been good. And so there's, there's things that develop here and waiting for, for uh, reinforcements, if you will, Timothy and, and, uh, and Silas to show up, which they do in the next verse. How long is he, uh, how long is he going to be here? 18 months. 18 months. Now, this is, this is keep that in your mind as we, as we, as we talk about this. And we'll see what happens here. Because as he's there, and as he sees what's going on, verse 5, it says, And when, Sin when Silas and Timothy came to him for Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely through the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. It's kind of like, all right, they're here. Now I can devote my full attention to what I, I need to do. And he, and he, and he starts that. And when, he, and when they resisted and, blast, and blasphemed, he shook off his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. Uh, for now I shall go on to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and went to the house of a certain, a certain named Titus Justice, a worshiper of God, whose house was next to the synagogue. And Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord and all his household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were, were believing and being baptized. So we see the beginnings of the church being established in Corinth at this point. We see it in its very, its very early stages, and we see some things that are happening in their leadership as far as the, as far as the Jews are concerned with, um, 
These two fellows listed here as they be, they have become believers as well. Go ahead. Is uh, I think you just said is this Christmas the same guy as Justice and Seven? Uh, same no. No, different oh, ones. And, 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 and the deal is, and I, I wanted to touch on that later. It's a good point. Thank you. The leader of the synagogue. There could be more than one. Okay, it wasn't necessarily the case that you had a leader. Sometimes you had more than that. And you'll see that he's listed here. And also, um, um, where's the other one? Both of them, I think, t- worshiper of God was, was justice, uh, verse 7. And then, then, uh, then when they okay, when they when they get to to the uh, synagogue, um, uh, Sosthenes is also called leader of the synagogue. So there could there could have been more than one. Okay, and so this this takes place, and Crispus is a follower of the Lord uh, as well. And this had to shake up the leadership a bit in the synagogues at this time because. Of, of these of these individuals um, uh, becoming Christians. Now I want to I want to take a look. Go ahead. I'm sorry. That's right. Um, I just want to say that I, I found out that um, the Roman Catholic, you know, the Pope, the mm-hmm. Roman Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, he's trying his best to get all one religion under Catholic. Yeah, didn't work. And it, he's still trying to do it today. Yeah, it still ain't working. <laughs> <laughs> Still in work. Nope. That's right. And and you you bring up a good point. I was asked the question and I forgot to answer it. But when did that? When did the Catholic Church come into existence? Uh, it, was, it was before uh, Jesus' time. Well, yeah, but as far as it actually taking a a, a that's what they want you to understand. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to where it really starts into where they've got the Pope, because they take their Pope and they hook it up with right. Peter. Right. Well, that's got to be. Mm-hmm. So, really, when it takes its form, it's in it's in the second or third century mm-hmm. before it before it finally kicks in mm-hmm. into a big. Yeah, so it's there, there's some years involved, but it doesn't go back as far as they'd like you to think it does. Oh, right. <laughs> as far as something, but I want to get to verse nine because you know we've talked about Paul and 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 Paul's an incredible icon as far as the New Testament is concerned. But I want us to see the human side of him for a minute. Now understand all the stuff. We've talked about the stuff that, that has happened to him, the persecutions that have gone on that we've got record of so far, and this is just a second journey. Okay? And we don't have near all of them. I'll tell you that. We don't have near all of them. We just have what Luke shares with us and what other, other writers have shared with here. But look what takes place in verses 9 and 10. Because... The Lord said to Paul in the night in a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you and and no man shall attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. Paul Paul wasn't the only one, or we're not the only ones, I should say, that at times need some encouragement. Now, it don't get any better than this. I mean, when you get this kind of, this, this is it, all right? But what I'm getting at is you can get down. Anybody could get down. And I think the Lord knew that Paul at this point needs a little bit of shot here to keep him going and keep going. And, 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 and I, I think that's incredibly valid and a good point because in, in spite of everything you think about him, he's still a human being. He still has the same feelings you and I have. He still gives his ups. He has his downs. Okay. And this is a case here where the Lord took care of it. Go ahead. Two, I think here, Paul, like you said, he would be at, at Ephesus. They'd make a big uproar. He'd have to leave the next place, a big uproar. He'd have to leave another place, another big uproar. He'd have to leave. Just a matter of just short time. And I think this is the Lord saying to Paul, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're going to be able to stay for a while. And, you know, just staying there for a while and just preaching is going to allow him to rest because he's not going to have to be a traveling opportunity. Right. So I think that was one of the ideas when he said, uh, Be not afraid, but speak, and behold, and hold on thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall sit on thee to hurt thee. 
for I have much people in this city. And what he's saying, I have these people here. So you just sit back here and preach and you know rest up a lot. Right. Take take your time. Now that doesn't mean everything stops. And we'll touch on we'll touch on that verse verse eleven. And he settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Now that's six eight months, or I'm sorry, eighteen months that he's there. There's two letters written. Okay, first and second Thessalonians are penned by Paul, transmitted to Thessalonica. You remember he's down here at Corinth. Thessalonica's up here in Macedonia. He writes first first Thessalonians. And according to 1 Thessalonians, I think chapter 2, Timothy is the courier that takes it from, from Corinth to back to Thessalonica. Okay, so there's, there's letters being written. Just because Paul left the city and moved on to the next point, it didn't mean he said, okay, I, I'm, I'm not worried about you now. He was. He was. And that's why we've got 12 to 13 books written by him as a result of these three journeys. And that's what that's what this is going to be all about. So he makes his both first. He makes the first letter to the, to the Thessalonians, sends it to Timothy. Timothy comes back with a report of how well the letter was received. Okay, and in short order, he pins the second letter and sends it to them because there was some questions relative to what he had written in the first letter, particularly <laughs> relative to those who had died. And, and, and the resurrection of the dead, you know, relative to that being Christians or not, you know, whatever. You know, and so Paul clarifies that in Second Thessalonians as well. So there's a lot of stuff going on. He's, he's, he's teaching and preaching still at Corinth at this time, but also then he's, he's writing, writing letters. We'll see more of this, particularly on the third journey when he gets to Ephesus. We'll, we'll see more of that. We'll touch on that when we get there. But for right now, he's got these two letters that, uh, that have been written and, and moving on. But the work in Corinth is not without its own issues. Uh, it's not without its own situation because we can see in verse 12, it says, while, while Gallio was with the proconsul in Achaia, the Jews um, with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat, saying, this man persuades, persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, this is interesting. When Paul's about ready to say something, Galileo says to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrong or vicious crime of Jews, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. <coughs> but if there are any questions about words and names and your own law, look after it yourselves. I'm unwilling to, I'm unwilling to, uh, to be a judge in these matters. And he drove them away from the judgment seat and they all took hold of Sothenes, the leader of the synagogue, and began to beat him in front of the judgment seat. And Galileo had no concern about any of these things. I want to touch base on how all this is happening here and what the setting is. You know, Galileo is a Roman authority. Okay? He's putting up with these Jews because he's stuck with them. Okay? They're part of what he has, and they're part of what he has to contend with. And so when they bring this accusation of Paul to him, he says, this isn't my problem. It's yours. I mean, if it was a matter of Roman law, if it was a matter of Roman whatever, sure, I'd, I'd do it. But it's a matter of your Jewish words, questions, etc., and I'm not going to deal with it. I'm a, you guys get out of here. Now, what I want us to see, you remember when we talked about the beating that Paul endured with rods? And we talked about the Roman goons that did it. All these proconsuls had their own goon squad. Okay? And these guys packed these rods with them as a way to show the power of Rome. And in no way did it have any problem with them using them if they needed to. And they did. And right here's probably here's the case where it, where it takes place. It's the Roman, pro, Roman goon squad that does the beating of the uh, leader of the synagogue, Sothenes, and Galileo says, I don't care. You do what you want to do. You know? I was confused about because it was like yeah. Jews are taking him up there, and then it says the Greeks beat him up. Yeah, because, because yeah, and, and, and again, you got to understand, Rome, Rome's position is, I'm going to have order. 
you're going to do it because I said do it, and it's going to be by the Roman law that it's going to be done. He wouldn't, have, he wouldn't authorize a, a Jewish situation to take place right here in front of him. That would be the same thing as a riot, you know, in his mind. So that's why he has his, his own group, his people here. They administer the justice, and we move on to the next case. <laughs> you know, we move on to the next case. And so that's what takes place. And so uh, Galilee is not concerned about any of these things, and it just moves on to the next, next, next page. So uh, Paul having remained, remained many days, not, um, sorry, Paul having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea of Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila. Let's talk about that just a minute because I want to show you what takes place here. Corinth is, where are they located right now? Ephesus is over here. So to get from Corinth to Ephesus is going to be by ship. And they'll leave out of the eastern port from Corinth headed that direction. And, and making their way toward that, uh, they, he takes Priscilla and Aquila with him as, as he makes that journey, leaving the brethren there. Whether or not the occasion in front of Galileo happens at the first part of the 18 months, or the middle part, or the end of the 18 months, we're not told. We don't know. Because he makes the, ver he makes the, the comment, um, where did I have it? Hold on, I've got to find it again. That, that he, that he, verse 18, And Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and went out. To, we don't know what that many days represents. If that was months, weeks, you know, whatever. But in that time frame, this takes place, and after that, you know, after it kind of settles down, then Paul takes his leave, heading on back then ultimately to uh, the Caesarea and Antioch on the way. So as he gets to Ephesus, look at the last part of uh, chapter 18, because he says in Chincheria, which would have been, you know, the seaport, the seaport city, and having his hair cut, he was keeping a vow. Paul, for whatever reason, um, took that vow, had, had that thought process in mind. Now, as, as your King James Version talks about it, as he talks about it a little bit further, he's, he tells the people in Ephesus that he's getting on to Jerusalem be, to keep the feast. When you think about him, him with the vow that he has here and the shearing of his head and so forth, that was the conclusion of that vow. And to complete that, to, com to wrap that all up, that had to be burnt at the, at the temple in Jerusalem. Now, what's all that mean? Yeah. I think he may have done this for the same reason that he had Timothy circumcised when he took him in with, to the see the Jews to kind of maybe get an upper edge, maybe so they would listen to him. Possibly. It sure didn't hurt. Because he didn't have to keep that ball. I, I, think, I think more basic is the philosophy of this. Okay? If you're, if you're of Jewish belief, fine. Uh, that's cool. I mean, I hate, Paul didn't have a problem with that. If you're of Gentile belief... As long as you're converted to Christ and you're and you're becoming a Christian, whatever customs and things you normally had as being a Greek, that's fine too. As long as it doesn't contradict the law of Christ, we're good. So, if what, what was Paul's background? What was he religiously before he became a Christian? A Jew, a Jew. Pharisee. So if that was part of what he wanted to do, to practice, as part of that being, there was no problem with that. There was no problem with that. And so he, him doing that is okay. However, I think your idea too, Belvis, is also there uh, with that too, because it allows him then the opportunity. He gets to Jerusalem. You know he's going to have a group of people to be able to talk to. And that's a good way to, you know, make that introduction like that too. So that's a good point. Go ahead, Bill. Well, too, I thought that like on this, since, since he had made a vow, he had made the vow to God. Mm -hmm. And the only way that he knew of completing that vow was by doing it that way he went to Jerusalem to burn. Right. You know, and that ended the vow. Right. You know, and it's like us. Uh, we need to be careful about how we vow things. Uh, mm hmm you remember, was it Jabez that said the first thing come out of his door, he would vow yep. to the Lord? So 
That we was a be careful if we make the vow, we got to try our best to carry through with it. Yes. So I, I think it was just the fact that this is how they solved their vows and they <coughs> did that. Not not as a Christian, hmm. but just saying, I know this is the way we've always did this and I'll I'll do this vow. Because and we don't know what the vow was. And I think Belvis's point of, of let's don't make any any waves here. Right. That's just one less issue that, that that's taking out of the out of the way there, and I. I, I that's going to turn him right into the temple and stuff. Exactly, exactly. So thoughts on that? Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Good. So he he leaves then, and goes to Ephesus, uh, verse nineteen, and he left Priscilla and Aquila there. We'll talk about that in a little while as we get into in the, into the third <laughs> journey. But he leaves them at the Ephesus at the time, and he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Verse 20, and when they asked him to stay a little longer, he did not consent. And I think King James Version talks about, or has it listed there in that phrase, that he needed to get on to Jerusalem because of the feast. It's interesting, in the New American Standard, that phrase is not here. Okay? <laughs> it's not here. But it is in the King James Version uh, to give a little more focus as to why he was getting on to Jerusalem. And so, but taking leave of them and saying, I will return again if God wills, and he set out, set sail from Ephesus. So he leaves Ephesus, and he's going to keep on coming down here then to uh, Caesarea, down here at the bottom of the map. And um, when he landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and went down to Antioch. How do we know he went to Jerusalem? You were listed. Thank you. That's exactly how we know. If you went anywhere relative to Jerusalem, you went up. <laughs> there was no choice. If you went anywhere from Jerusalem, you went down. Okay? And so that's exactly what takes place here. And we know that's what happens as he leaves then from <laughs> Jerusalem and he goes on then to Antioch of Syria. So he, uh, he makes that route and, he, and, and we talk about that and we look at this this morning. And we see the, the circles around Ephesus, and we see the circles around Caesarea and Jerusalem. And we say, okay, that's, that's not that big a deal. You talk about miles. You're looking at almost 600 miles travel from Ephesus to Caesarea by boat. It wasn't quick. Okay? Depending on the winds, depending on the time of the year, depending on the currents. Uh, that's how that's what you have to put up with the other thing that could enter into the idea too uh, of him getting from Ephesus to Jerusalem at a certain time for the feast okay was also again the availability of transportation I mean boats didn't run on a regular circus you know time if whatever was there and you could get a spot on it that's what you did and and that's how it worked so all kinds of things could work into the whys okay none of it terribly important relative to timings and that kind of stuff. He just had a plan and work uh, to, to achieve that and gets back to Antioch. Verse 22 wraps up the second journey. Okay? Verse 22, the second journey is done, and he's back at Antioch of Syria. So um, I, I, I left it that way because I wanted to touch base uh, as we get into then the latter part of chapter 18. And we'll, and we'll talk about that because uh, there's some things that take place here that we want to that we want to share with you uh, let me I got to jump programs here just a minute bear with me just a second because I got a map here that's pretty 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 cool time wise uh, let me let me start that start sharing this with you here, because time wise, as we're looking at, at the, the beginning of the of the third journey, we're at eighty probably fifty two to fifty three, in that time frame, uh, as he makes then the route and keeps continuing back probably the latter part of eighty fifty three he's going to be back in Ephesus again, but take a look at what takes place here. We talked about we talked about the trip from. Anti from Ephesus to Caesarea to Jerusalem and Antioch. That's 906 miles. Bear in mind that 600 miles from Ephesus to Jerusalem, you're 300 miles from Jerusalem back up to Antioch of Syria. Okay? Verse 23, 
And having spent some time there, he departed and passed successively through the Galatian region, Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. And now a certain named Jew, a certain Jew named Apollos, verse 24. Verse 23 gets him back to Ephesus. And so he's left to Antioch. He's gone back up through the regions that he's passed through, through Galatia, the four, the four cities there in Galatia. He's back in Antioch, back in, in Ephesus now. In one verse. In one verse. Okay? Total there is 609 miles. So when you look at the whole thing from two verses, he's 1,515 miles round trip and back to Ephesus. That didn't happen in a day or two. <laughs> that did not happen in a day or two. And so making that route, making the stops that he would have made in the cities, in the four cities of Galatia, if nothing else, would have taken time. Strengthening and teaching the, the Christians that were already there, dealing with or whatever the problems that he had already faced there before, and helping those people through those problems as well, and then getting back to Ephesus. It's a huge amount of, huge amount of travel and a huge amount of of, um, of things that he's going to have to, to endure. Uh, Ephesus is going to be an amazing stop because he's going to be there three years. Okay? In that length of time, we'll share with you some things that are, you know, we know about, you know, the, the ride and so forth that takes place in Ephesus. I'm going to give you some background as to how he felt about it uh, as we get into this because it's, it's very, very special. So the question comes up when we take it all of this and we look at these journeys, what do we get out of this? History is one thing, that's true. But what do we get out of it? What do we learn? Well, we can see the hardship, well, I don't say hardship, but we can see the determination <coughs> of the Apostle Paul <coughs> to take the gospel into all the world. Mm -hmm. I was just sitting here thinking, you know, have to travel like he traveled and to be treated like he was treated he took a beat down there where he went mm -hmm. so you learn that Paul was a determined man and when he said I have fought a good fight you can certainly count that he did yep yep and it makes us take a look at our situations and say do we really have it that bad he had some good shoes too didn't he though <laughs> yeah. no good. yes he also uh, uh, obeyed God, God uh, by doing what uh, uh, He wanted him to do. No matter, no what. matter what. No matter what. No, no matter what kind That's right. Was. That's right. Good point. And that's the way we need to be. Hey. There you go. That's right. I totally agree. All right. Well, we'll stop it right here. We'll pick this up on Wednesday night. We'll pick him up here on the in, in, in Ephesus. On Wednesday evening, and have several things. We'll go over the questions before we get started on that on chapter 18, and then and then we'll get into that. But we appreciate your help this morning. Thank you for everything that you helped me with this, and then we'll get this Wednesday night. Thank you.